The story of Venice began more than a thousand years ago in the middle of a vast stretch of water in the north of Italy on the Adriatic coast. This is the lagoon, 50 kilometers long and 10 wide. It's made up of brackish water, sand, and mud. In short, it was a place that was hostile to human presence and of no interest to anyone. But this all changed in the fifth century when Europe was set ablaze by hordes of barbarians. People living on the coast sought refuge in the lagoon. The lagoon provided natural defenses. It was very difficult for enemies to sail their boats and find their way. Only the people living there knew where the canals were, so they had no need for walls to protect them. That was a great advantage. The first paradox is that the Venetians, who would later conquer the world, began their story as refugees in the middle of nowhere with no drinking water. To build their first houses, they had to use whatever came to hand. We have a few pictures that help us to form an idea of what the Rialto Island might have been like. Rialto was the center of town, with thatched wooden huts. The first buildings on the ancient site of Venice were in the most stable areas of ground. For example, Rialto comes from Rivo Alto, which was a high, solid bank. Dorso Duro, the name comes from the fact that it was a more solid piece of land. The early town was built on places like that. But that is still a long way from La Serenissima that we know today. It wasn't until a few hundred years later that the little wooden huts were replaced by the impressive Rialto Bridge and the palaces that surround it. The first Venetians lived on small islands separated by water. Each one was a little village designed on the same lines. A square, dwellings all around it, and in the middle, the church. That explains why we have so many churches and small squares. They were the centers of the ancient micro-villages. And through the centuries, these islands were linked by improvised bridges, often built on the slant. But during the seventh century, the Venetians started to be short of space. The solution was to build new artificial areas of land on the water. But building on the bed of the lagoon was anything but easy. The bottom is composed of sediment and mud, and a lot of currents flow through it. In short, ground that was moving all the time. Here, even from a geological viewpoint, we are between sea and land. The factors are discontinuous. On the one hand, the rivers bring us sand from dry land. That forms a certain type of ground. Where there are reeds, the ground is made of peat, which has quite a different density. Venice itself was born on this multitude of geological strata on very varied type and solidity, and that caused problems. Today, when we see a church tower leaning over, we know it's because it's standing on several different strata, so the tower tips sideways. The church towers of Venice lean, but they don't collapse. So, what tour de force did the Venetians dream up? How did they manage to make the ground firmer? The builder's secret was ordinary wooden piles. Hundreds of thousands of them were driven into the bed of the lagoon. And miraculously, the builders discovered beneath the sand a layer of caranto, or clay. It lay at a depth of three to eight meters below sea level. The piles had to go down far enough to be driven into the clay to stabilize the ground. Stabilizing the ground meant marking out the limits of a certain zone with piles. 
If I take some piles and I dry them into the mud and then soak it all with water, the ground between the piles will compact and stay more solid than the ground that's outside the perimeter. It's held in place by the piles which stop it being washed out. That's the theory of ground stabilization. That's how the Venetians created artificial areas on which the town could grow, with sand from the lagoon held in by wooden piles. And the builders made another stunning discovery. Wood driven into the mud doesn't deteriorate. It's the poles that are underneath the buildings in the mud is that they're, they're permanently in oxygen-free environment. So none of the microbes that would normally decay wood can get into them. The wood undergoes a process of mineralization. It becomes as hard as stone and can remain intact for centuries. The most famous Venetian monuments were born on land consolidated in this way. St. Mark's Square with its bell tower that alone rests on 100,000 piles. The foundations of the Rialto Bridge, 12,000 piles. And even more impressive, the imposing Basilica La Salute, built entirely of marble, even more than a million piles. Mind-boggling figures. Today, there are eight to 10 wooden piles per square meter. The town was created on these piles. You might even say it's an upside down forest. The piles fulfill the function of roots and there are an incredible number of them. It's estimated that in all, 10 million piles were driven into the sands of the lagoon, the equivalent of one third of the land forest. They're mainly oak and larch that are reputed to be very strong and were brought from nearby coasts. To stabilize their ground and to bear the weight of the palaces, the Venetians spared no expense. A study shows that the foundations account for half the cost of the building. The other half goes to the superstructure of the palaces. This means that the submerged part costs as much as the part above the water. The town's 400 palaces all rest on these unique foundations. Built from the 11th century onwards, they are the true superstructures of their time. To make these palaces last in an unstable and moving environment, the builders called upon all their genius because they faced a triple challenge. To protect the buildings from the saltwater tides, to build the lightest possible structures on sandy ground, and to take into account the movements of the lagoon bed. This is the brilliant idea they came up with. On the piles, the Venetian architects placed a first stratum of wooden flatbeds. Then there were several layers of bricks, on top of which the builders had the idea of laying a special white stone imported from the Dalmatian coast, Istrian stone. This was the first line of defense against the movement of the tides. That deals with the interface between the water and the air. That resists an infinitely long time because it's not permeable to the salty water. Resistant and impermeable, Istrian stone served as a protective wall. It easily stands up against the comings and goings of the salt water. The height of the stone layer was calculated in function of the height of the tides, and therefore it prevented the water from breaching the load-bearing walls that were made of bricks and were much lighter. The rule of the time was, do not build above three floors. understood when they were building that they couldn't make it too heavy because they knew that it was all relatively fresh mud in geological terms that still compacts and causes subsidence. Slender columns and large windows, 
Through their concern for weight, the architects created a unique style that was elegant and like lacework, the typical Venetian style. All they had to do now was find the way for the building to adapt to the moving ground of the lagoon. The movements of the ground and of the water are variable, so the buildings couldn't be rigid. Here, too, the Venetians found shrewd solutions, using the materials that they had locally, in particular lime mortar. It was used for building brick walls. Its advantage over cement was that while it was used like cement, it remained supple. Lime was probably the most important material because it's adaptable. It's not rigid like cement, it can adapt. The aim was always to build, create what they had in mind, but something that could move over time. Second example, the floors between the levels. They were made of wood, a material that is flexible and that can transform. And to ensure the flexibility of the walls and floors, the builders came up with another trick. The beams were rested on the walls, but in such a way that they could move. Flexible, supple, and adaptable, the Venetian building is like a living organism that changes shape according to the whims of the unstable foundations. Today, the palaces bear the stigmata of time. Some balconies are distorted. Sometimes fissures appear inside the buildings. There has been a bit of subsidence. Some facades have twisted and leaned a little. But no palace in Venice has ever collapsed. Venetian engineers designed their buildings so well that they can even absorb the impact of earthquakes, which are common in the region. I remember my father-in-law telling me about when there was the earthquake in Friuli in the 1970-something, and Venice <coughs> felt the shocks of that very strongly. And um, where we live, there's very tall, big arched windows, you know, with lead holding the panes of glass. And he said that the windows just moved like the sails of a boat and then came back in place. Not one of those little panes cracked and fell out. 